So I'm here today at the Spey Bay in the north of Scotland. I'm looking at the defences that run for about 10 kilometres from Lossiemouth to the west to Kingston to the east. I've just walked the defences to see what's there and to plan a route back. So in this video, we're going to have a look at the almost continuous 10 kilometres of beach defences and coastal crust that exist here at the Bay of Spey in Scotland. were constructed in around the 1940-1941 period uh, post Dunkirk. They consist of hundreds of thousands of tonnes of reinforced concrete in the form of an almost continuous line of large anti-tank cubes interspersed every few hundred metres by pillboxes. Two styles of pillbox, we have a hexagonal type as we see here, and there's also a rectangular type, all with concrete machine gun tables providing enfilade fire along the defences um, that run all the way up the beach and through the forest, and also um, out to the front. There's a coastal artillery battery, an emergency battery, that was armed with two six-inch guns that we'll also have a look at. So that was the very first pillbox. Um, I'm out to the west. Um, uh, with the defences begin and they start here at this confluence between um, a canal and then a smaller tributary uh, which runs through the forest and we, we can have a look at that and see how, uh, how that large water feature has been used as very much as an anti-tank obstacle. So along the edge of the canal uh, is what I think is the only the only set of these um, in this line of defences. And this is a concrete roadblock. So in here, in these slots, would have been placed at three different heights, um, either large um, wooden sleepers or cut up bits of steel of rail track. So the idea is these could be opened up to allow friendly vehicles through and up the um, canal path. Um, also helping in the construction and maintenance of the defences, but then they could also be closed. Or well, one end would be dropped into the socket, um, and then the bar, uh, the bar dropped across to close off and seal off this uh, this road. And every obstacle, the principle of obstacles, is that they are covered by fire. And that pillbox that we just walked past, I don't know now if we can see it, but it's just over there. So this first obstacle is well within the field of fire um, of probably the heavy machine guns that would have been would have been situated in, in there. And then just in the shrub here, we can start to see the, uh, the row of large anti-tank cubes that we're gonna follow for the next 10 kilometers through the forest and out onto the beach, all the way up to Kingston, to the east of Spey Bay. So I'm not going to be able to stop, and I, I won't be because they are very much similar at every obstacle we see, but I will be picking, um, picking obstacles on the way um, to have a look at and study in some more detail. So let's go. And we're just coming up to our second pillbox on the route. So you may think that it's very lightly defended because we don't have any of those tank blocks either side and those will become very familiar once we get down into the more open areas. But what this pillbox does have is actually more valuable than concrete and it's a natural defence. And if we have a look just over here, now it is very much covered with lots of lichen, but what we do have here is um, what looks like a 
man-made or man-cut, almost a water-filled anti-tank ditch. We've got a bank on the right, we've got a bank on the left. This would have been very hard for vehicles and indeed troops to cross, especially when under fire. Interesting, we have a ditch down here as well, and this may indeed have been an infantry fighting position. It was down low, um, so the troops didn't silhouette themselves. There was the high earth behind to help with that, and then they also had the bank in front of them. Now it is just possible that that is contemporary with the pillbox. Now what I don't think is contemporary with the pillbox is this wire, is this chicken wire. Now this, now correct me, it may be, um, and 85 year old galvanizing was certainly much better than it is today. But I think what it does do, if it isn't indeed original, it gives a good example of how pillboxes may have been camouflaged. So we can see we've got foliage on the, um, foliage on the roof, um, so that's earth grass. Uh, it obviously wouldn't have been as well grown um, or developed back then, but it could have been supplemented. And then with this chicken wire coming down the front, the shape and the outline of this concrete square essentially uh, could be covered up. Much harder to do if you're on a beach and you're part of that really obvious fixed line of defences. Somewhere like this, I think that really does give a good example of how the pillbox um, could have been camouflaged. And if we look at the siding of it, uh, we've got the exterior blast wall, we've got the reduced height door, and then inside um, we have, as I say, the, the concrete um, firing tables. And that very much in the direction we are pointing here, this very much is the direction of fire. Then not only are they protecting with these side loopholes, enfilade along the side of that canal. And if the trees weren't here, we could see that each pillbox would be interlocking. We could see the pillbox to our right and to our left as well. And as we've also seen, there would, there would most likely have been infantry defences um, dug in and around the forest as well. So really good sighting of a pillbox. Uh, some great idea of how it may be camouflaged and supplemented with the infantry defences and some of the natural defences that are sitting in front of it. So we have a lot more walking to do. We're probably only, only about 400 metres into this 10 or more kilometre um, line of defences. And as I say, we won't be stopping at every one, but I will give you a little countdown as we pass each pillbox. So at the moment, we're on pillbox number two. So onwards, and let's get out of this forest. Pillbox number three. And a few hundred meters from pillbox three, the anti-tank cubes start. Um, and these cubes are huge. They're about three feet square by four, in some cases, five feet high. And they're placed at about five feet intervals all the way to um, Kingston at the other side. And that's the route we're going to take. There's a little break in the middle where the terrain of the sand dunes uh, does enough defending um, it's pretty impossible to cross. Um, but other than that, these cubes continue all the way. Um, there's one place, if I can remember where it is, there's um, a cube comes up to a pillbox and it's not quite close enough. So instead of just accepting it and moving on, they've actually extended the cube by a foot or so. Um, so it's a very unusual shape just to try and close in that, uh, that gap. So absolutely rigid. Um, in their in their planning and construction and just coming up in front of us is pillbox four uh, now we'll just have a quick look at this because there are a number of um, of these defenses that show the same sort of damage um, and if you just look at the roof you can see there's been something catastrophic um, happen in the roof. And as I say, we see this in a few of the pillboxes along the way, and it looks as if they've, they've been used for some sort of assault training purposes. Because um, that, that to me looks like an explosive entry. Um, 
the rebar has been um, has been twisted and, and contorted out of shape um, as well as there's there's evidence of small and shrapnel inside but as I say there's some better examples out uh, on the beach that we can have a look at so pillbox number four we'll keep going after after running inland this is now where the defensive wall turns and heads straight out to the coast like this way um, but this pillbox I think is worth stopping at and looking at a bit in a bit more detail um, so looking at the damage that has been incurred here now um, having been down and looked at the uh, Atlantic wall training sections in Surrey uh, it's quite easy to see what is um, explosive damage and I'm, I very much think that that holes like this given the hardness of concrete um, and given the the pitting that seems to exist so some of these so this may appear to be a direct impact such as from a, a high velocity round um, and this would need to be this 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 could be 50 cal um, that would cause that looking at damage like this this may be a ricochet so the round has the round has landed sideways so not not as much energy has transferred so the the pattern is a bit smaller or it could indeed be from shrapnel if high explosive uh, with splintering cases was fired and um, that mark may indeed be caused by shrapnel if we look at the blast wall at the front so this has this has just shattered and been pushed over and that may be as a result of whatever this impact was um, remembering that if, if, uh, if an explosion had occurred outside the pillbox here there may not necessarily or the, the the blast can cause sufficient damage without there necessarily needing to be any um, any splintering or direct hit or shrapnel uh, now certainly looking in there yeah you know, that you know that to me suggests absolutely that a, a high velocity round has hit has hit that and looking you know looking at the other the rest of this damage this pillbox pill has come under quite a lot of sustained fire or sustained um, attack around a number of the loopholes and in particular if we have a look at the at the side here uh, so not only has it if this was if this was natural and the concrete was of was of poor quality and was was eroding we wouldn't expect to see the rebar damaged um, as it is there and that's actually relatively thin rebar that has, that has been used um, although I imagine there's a, a heavier core um, inside and the same here this looks like impact damage from uh, from a large splintering explosive device um, but it's inside where the where the real damage is up here in the roof so we'll nip inside and we'll have a look at that roof damage and here we are inside the pillbox and just look at that damage now from my understanding that is the sort of of effect we would expect from something like a hash round a high explosive squash head um, or just a um, a block of explosive has been placed on the roof so it hasn't been um the brisson so the effect of the explosive hasn't been enough to uh, to damage and and tear the rebar as I think you would expect if there was something coming with some velocity said it was a an air dropped uh, munition coming down with some velocity I would have expected that to have ripped through the cast iron work but the fact that it shattered the concrete um, and it has deformed the rebar that suggests that that is the effect of explosive And this is also very interesting so if we remember on the outside of the pillbox the uh, the second impact that we saw this is just immediately on the inside of that wall um, so same as I think has caused that hole in the roof there has been a quantity of explosive or perhaps something like a hash round fired at the far side of this wall not enough to penetrate the wall but the explosive shockwave has forced through and caused this spalling effect. So the interior surface of that concrete and pillbox 
um, has been shattered, and that then has projected fragments uh, across uh, across the pillbox. Um, and a real a, a real perk of um, of sort of of this um, hash round technology, and this is why the British like it a lot. So it doesn't need to penetrate um, a structure or a vehicle, but that explosive force will cause this spalling and rupturing of the material, whether it's metal, whether it's concrete, and still cause maximum damage to the personnel inside. So that. That would be my fair guess as what has been what has been attempted um, on this pillbox. And some of that if we look if we looked directly opposite that, so some of the material from here um, has probably come down and damaged. And in fact it's it looks like that's the leg from the corner of this firing bench. So that has been flung across um, with the violence of that explosion. Certainly a very sobering fact. It's one thing to walk around and um, and look and admire these pillboxes as they stand today, um, but something we're not very used to in this country is is actually seeing the effects of um, of attack such as we would um, in and around France and Germany. So this has been pillbox number five. We'll keep going along the line. And actually, not very far away from pillbox five is number six, which is just up in front of us. Um, so we may get used to the fact, especially on a, on a defensive line such as this, that all the pillboxes are equidistant apart. They're all spaced the same distance apart. But have a look at the terrain here. So there is absolutely some very difficult terrain, both the undulations um, uh, of the sand dunes um, at the rear here, and also this, this sand dune area out to the front but also because the line turns this pillbox therefore lacks some of that um, mutual defense from the pillbox that would have been to the left as we look at it we have number uh, four on up the line to the right then this one sits in the corner so actually very close to it is number six uh, right in front of us and this is another interesting feature uh, here is to build these cubes into the, into the terrain and to make them much stronger. So most of them, as we'll see on the beach, don't actually have, have any foundations as such. Uh, a small hole was dug, formwork erected, and then the concrete was just poured into them with some reinforcing steel. But here, what has happened is they've mixed uh, concrete with some, some thick aggregate uh, to form this, uh, this sort of stepped bed that these cubes um, are fixed on. And this was a technique that was used uh, by the Germans really quite a lot. They didn't tend to use um, small independent anti-tank cubes or dragon's teeth because they, they knew they could just be pushed over um, and disrupted that way. Uh, that took a lot more concrete, that took a lot more labour. Uh, we didn't have the resources, um, I presume, to do that. However, we did know they, um, we did, we did know we had research that said uh, they did that, but that, that probably came later in the war. Uh, remember, these were constructed at that very early uh, post-Dunkirk phase. Uh, so this is pillbox number six, a great hexagonal example. Um, we can see there's the, there's the one loophole facing straight out at the kind of the killing zone in front of us. And then also we have one on either side. So this loophole is able to see up the left hand side of these um, cube defences um, and this secondary pole can see up the interior of the defences. And this is, you may, uh, you may be familiar with this, with this image, we see this a lot, uh, very really beautiful, would be nice with some, um, some uh, setting sun and maybe some mist, but this row of cubes just goes off into the distance and then just over the far hill we have the beach. So this is probably the quietest it'll be um, for the rest of the video. And before we stop here, maybe I shouldn't have said we'll stop at every interesting feature because there are quite a lot. And what I'm interested in is how these cubes and defences were constructed and how they how they lasted. So this one has, has really been, been totally destroyed. Uh, we can see two types of reinforcing have been used. We have our thick reinforcing bar, which I imagine would have formed the outer cube. And then we have the, uh, the much thinner reinforcing 
uh, reinforcement bar, almost to make like a, a little gabion perhaps. Then with the, the wooden shutter in a formwork around the outside. And if we look at what it has been filled with, so if you read any manual on concrete, it says, don't use rounded stones and rounded pebbles because they just don't bond to the cement. Concrete, of course, being an aggregate of, um, basically a coarse aggregate with cement. Um, so the cement is the, is the thing that bonds it. And you can see here the, the reason for that. You can see these, uh, these smooth beach pebbles of which there are millions of tons on the beach. Um, so I see why they use them, but they, have, they, haven't, they haven't bonded terribly well. Um, and whenever, however this has been demolished, um, it has caused it to, uh, caused it to disintegrate quite badly. And then as those of you who watch this channel enough will know, I love, we can see the circular saw marks where this plank has, um, has been through the mill um, to saw off. This, the, this not actually being the plank, but that is a, an impression of the wood that was used to form the cube. So these videos are getting, uh, Somewhat geekier, but I imagine there's there's enough of an audience out there that will find them interesting enough to keep watching. So let us keep going, and I'll try and get some scenic shots of uh, of this line before we get to the beach. So we're out on the beach now. It's four and a half miles to Kingston that direction, and at the moment we have no defences. Well, with no man-made defences, uh, the Anti-tank wall that we saw in the forest has stopped. And this portion of land, this is inside the there, which is now wooded. Uh, it's unlikely to have been um, 85 years ago. That's very difficult going. It'll be difficult for troops and it'll be difficult for absolutely for vehicles um, to get through. So probably in there would have been uh, infantry defenses, fire trenches, um, dug to keep the battle mobile if any troops did get get down in there including probably the use of small field guns um, and defenses to supplement uh, those heavy weapons that would be have been protected in the pillboxes or at least that was the concept at the start uh, we moved very quickly uh, once we started rearming we moved very quickly from the concept of pillboxes fixed defenses to uh, too much more mobile uh, state of defences. So instead of investing even more money in coastal crust and stop lines, uh, we were investing in aircraft and ships um, in rearming uh, after Dunkirk. I keep mentioning Dunkirk because really it is the it is the pivotal um, event that happens early on in the war after the BEF was kicked out of France. It really was the pivotal event um, that led us down this rabbit hole of having to um, having to arm and protect our shores. Um, and then after that obviously came the Battle of Britain, uh, which if it hadn't, if we hadn't succeeded um, in maintaining air superiority during the Battle of Britain, then you know almost certainly these defences that we see in the beaches would absolutely have been used. Um, so we will keep going. We're on the hunt for pillbox number seven. I forgot to actually count them on the way out, so I'm not even sure how many there are. So on the hunt for pillbox number seven, it should be, I can see it, pillbox number seven up ahead. Picking up where the natural terrain leaves off, coming out onto the coast, we have our anti-tank cubes and we have pillbox number seven. And here we are at pillbox eight. So as I mentioned earlier, there are two types of pillbox in this beach. And this happens to be one of the four-sided uh, rectangular, essentially it's a machine gun post, as opposed to uh, perhaps a, a pillbox or another defense. It, more specifically, I would call it a machine gun post. Uh, be constructed using wooden shuttering and formwork as, as all the pillboxes in this beach have. Um, it has particularly nice chamfered edges. Um, so that's, that's taken a lot of effort to do. Um, we can also see, if we look around this embrasure, there is the outline of um, a particular rectangular piece. And that appears on all of the, um, all of the defences we see here. So I imagine there was a specific uh, box that they made or to a particular pattern um, that just made for ease of construction um, that allowed them to form these loopholes. And, and as I say, that's 
uh, that, that sort of witness mark is visible on um, all of the pillboxes. Uh, we're going to go inside and have a look at this uh, specific one. It's a relatively clean and intact example. So we have the reduced height door that then takes us into this relatively small um, position. So the two main loopholes are looking out down the row, uh, down the row of obstacles. Uh, and remember, these are the obstacles that are left today. It's likely the beach would have been mined. There may have been anti-landing scaffolding. There would certainly have been rows and rows of barbed wire as well as other beach obstacles. So this pillbox specifically designed for providing enfilade fire, that is fire down the line of defences that we have. And as you notice, we are on the beach side. So we are on the, the side that the enemy would be on. There's also this other small loophole here and this, this does indeed look out um, towards the beach. And this, this may have been for a light machine gun, perhaps just a brain on a bipod. Um, it may have been for a, uh, for a rifle, or it may just have been for that situational awareness that the occupants or the, the commander of these two machine guns um, would have been able to see, uh, see the enemy approaching. And as with all the pillboxes in this line, um, they have these concrete firing tables uh, there are no recesses, there are no witness marks to suggest that, that weapons were either, ever um, positioned and fired here. If that was the case, I'd have, I'd have imagined uh, a reasonable bit of scratching or damage. Um, and maybe indeed some of them were for, for training, but it doesn't appear that, that this one is just by looking at it. And so there we have it. Uh, simple, two embrasures looking down the line. Very simple, and these these machine gun posts would have um, these sit in between the other more complex um, five loopholed variant uh, that we'll see a little bit later on. So this is pillbox seven, I think seven of. As I say, I didn't I didn't count them, and I'm actually unaware of how many there are. Uh, so we will continue on the journey up this line. So far. Um, I've, I've walked 17 kilometres and it's taken me, well, six and three quarter hours, but I have been doing a lot of stopping. I've photographed every one of these pillboxes. I spent an hour or so around the coastal artillery um, battery that's there. So you're joining me on my, hope my return back to the car, which is hopefully still where I parked it. And yes, lots more defences, pillboxes and features to go. So here is a fortuitous place to pause before we get to the ninth pillbox. So you, the astute of you may be able to see on the sand dune there um, a searchlight position and that is the westerly searchlight position supporting the double six inch gun um, emergency coastal artillery battery uh, just up here so we'll have a pop in and we'll visit but also in front of us we have two um, I was going to say collapsed but they've just been knocked over um, of these large anti-tank cubes and I mentioned before about the foundations and we saw um, in the forest um, that actually some had been joined together in their foundations to make them stronger but here we see the above ground cube and then we see what would have lain below ground. So a, a shallow recess uh, was dug in the beach, concrete was poured, um, and then it, it just filled the formwork, uh, which will have the steel inside. So as you can see, foundations not very deep at all. Was that a problem? Well, given that these cubes um, were, were part of one large defensive structure, each was supported by the um, the automatic or, or heavy weapons that may have been contained in the pillboxes providing that enfilade fire. So uh, most armoured vehicles, it would take armoured vehicles um, like our sort of Hobart's Funnies, um, the Royal Engineer adapted vehicles to, to come and clear these things. Um, most of their protection comes from the front. So to, to have potentially heavy weapons firing at the side of these vehicles as they attempt, as people attempt to 
um, to get out and place charges, uh, place mines or explosives. That, that may be very difficult. However, I can't help but think um, a suitable armoured vehicle fitted with a plough that would um, stick the centre of the plough between two cubes and just drive with enough force through them, albeit um, under a certain amount of fire, would be able to, to, move these, to move these blocks to one side. And of course, a lot of the battle has to be lost in order for that to happen. The Royal Navy must have failed um, to allow the landing force to get close. The Royal Air Force would have failed um, to allow the landing force to get close. The Coastal Artillery Battery would have failed to allow the landing force to get so close. Um, but if they did, um, then this is, this is what, what may have happened. Um, but as we know, that the Atlantic Wall was, was probably more formidable, um, certainly on first appearances, um, than our coastal defences, and indeed it failed. But that was a lot of resource um, and very costly in terms of equipment and, um, and manpower to make that happen. So it is possible um, to overcome these, to overcome these defences. So anyway, there we go, pillbox number nine, and we're starting to see the coastal artillery um, battery that we're coming up against. And here we have it, pillbox number nine. Um, now this is interesting. My, my initial observation was that um, between every large pillbox was one of these smaller machine gun posts. But in this instance, it doesn't seem to be the case. We've just come from eight, which was a uh, machine gun post. Nine is also one of these machine gun posts. So we'll have to keep an eye out and see why that was, was the case. It may be because we had the coastal battery behind us, therefore it was um, it had a large proportion of uh, of troops that could be dug in to defend it. Um, but I, at the moment, I'm not sure. No, but so this is pillbox number ten. So we had two machine gun posts in a row, and now we're on to um, alternating. So this is the larger uh, the larger post. So you can see our cubes would have come up down this corner, and we have two loopholes either side, providing cover from two guns, one on either side. And if we look around on the, or to the front of the pillbox, that's very boggy, we can see we have a single, single loophole here facing out from the, to the direction of attack. That isn't supported with a concrete table, but it does look like a wooden table could be fitted in all of these um, hexagonal pillboxes. And there we can see um, the, uh, the foundation plinth so the foundation plinth would have would have um, would have been poured first, um, and you can see it's not it's not very thick at all. What's that? Twelve inches thick um, into the ground. So obviously here with with erosion, very boggy part of the beach. Um, this is about the only the only pillbox um, in this central section um, that has eroded. Now as we go further up the beach, um, at the Kingston end, there are quite a lot um, that have eroded that are in the sea, and we've we've lost quite a lot. So we will keep going on to hopefully find number 11 in the distance up ahead. Number 11, twin machine gun post. Pillbox number 12. So we're probably halfway up the beach to Kingstown. Um, I still can't see it. Uh, the last probably mile is on is on that top shingle but I've got that to put up put up with. Uh, you can see interesting some of the pillboxes have a not the whole roof covered in stones or beach pebbles but certainly around the top edge and the very prominent uh, number 12 here. Um, yeah just just to help um, I presume break up the shape a little bit or if indeed there was earth and sand piled on the roof. It would just give a little bit of little bit of structure to stop it falling off and eroding, um, I assume. But one of our hexagons, single embrasure out to sea, and then one front and rear of the obstacles, uh, providing that enfilade fire that we all know and love. So I'm gonna go onto this path. Um, and when we get up to 13, there's another little direction change. So you may have noticed, um, because obviously the terrain of the beach, so 12 is in the, the middle of a fixed line. Um, 11 was on a was on a bit of a corner. Uh, 
yeah with the wall with the wall went off in a slightly different direction all still perfectly coverable from the from the loopholes and gun positions inside so let's carry on to 13 generally find very interesting so there's been some erosion to this cube but what that has done is that has opened up the internal structure for us so we can see it's made of beach pebbles as all the others appear to be there's a, um, a reinforcing steel reinforcing bar cage um, which runs actually quite close to the surface um, and this seems to be the cause of most of most of these erosions is um, most likely that salt water uh, has been has been used in this construction that's caused the steel to corrode the expansion of that steel has caused then spalling um, of the um, of the concrete on the surface the concrete just to fall off and yeah you can see you can see on the top here as well that's happening um, really all over this block and then all that needs to happen is water gets in there in winter it freezes um, and then it just yeah it just it just really disintegrates quite rapidly so yeah a little sneak peek into some of the construction methods of these um, these monolithic cubes all the way along the beach wow look at this for an erosion pattern right the way around the base number 13 we'll not dwell too much on this oh maybe we have to so i mentioned earlier the cubes are all spaced pretty much equidistant apart um, if too much of a gap exists then they need to fill that somehow and this is one of those ways that they've done it so um, without having a tape measure um, I'm imagining what's that four foot uh, maybe a meter and a half um, gap and then obviously between the cube and the edge of the pillbox that would just have been too great so this extra chunk of concrete has been um, appended onto the uh, the last cube here before it meets the pillbox just to reduce that size so a lot of diligence a lot of effort has gone in to do that instead of just maybe moving it across a little bit to, to fill in that gap um, so yeah this is what uh, what happens when you're trying to measure to the to the inches it would have been and um, I suppose before the before the days of GPS but across a essentially a moving terrain over 10 kilometers so yeah pillbox 13 number 14 a nice tidy example of the pentagonal the larger um, quad machine gun posts here all the way down and we can we can really see how this interlocking fire would have worked so we can see 13 in the distance there we've got 14 and then 15 15 being one of the twin machine gun posts uh, 14 being the quad i.e there, there seem to be um, a pair of concrete benches on either side i.e four sort of permanently fixed machine guns and then 13 being the uh, twin again um, still with the yeah, stones around the edges and here actually they seem to be, be further on the roof so maybe actually some of them do have them uh, covering the roof as well so the journey continues uh, I think I worked out of about four kilometers left to go and if we're saying that there's a pillbox roughly every 500 meters that's another eight to go so 14 behind us and 15 up ahead post number 15 and one of the last ones remember we saw the gap was too large uh, here the gap is much smaller but smaller here is better less chance of troops or vehicles getting through 
So as we approach the 16th pillbox on this defensive line, it's just something I'd like to point out. So we have the line of obstacles uh, coming down center frame and you can just see the two loopholes one either side of that. Now something else which is which is rather interesting, which I think was was fixed in later designs of pillboxes. So have a look at the loophole and what do we see? We see straight through to the other side. So a big problem with that is that not only is the defender silhouetted in the loophole, so you can see whether the loophole is occupied or not, but a well-placed shot through one of these loopholes, even just a nearby explosion, um, would incapacitate potentially not just one fire, but those on the other side as well. And so what, what was typically constructed was an anti-ricochet wall, often, often just a single wall running up the middle of the pillbox. Um, because we have the external blast walls here, uh, let's have a look inside. Because we have the external blast wall here, uh, then one didn't need to be constructed inside. But with, um, with other designs of pillbox, there would have been a, a Y shape, almost like a blast trap, just inside the door, then with the, with the straight wall coming up the center. And that would have avoided both the silhouetting of the fires in these loopholes, but also that through and through um, if if fire managed to get to get in one of these get, get in one of these loopholes. Um, there's also no evidence of any shutters on these pillboxes. Uh, that was often a a later addition for pillboxes that were retained, protecting uh, key strategic points. Um, but also I would have thought along the beaches. So the, the purpose of shutters was to protect against flamethrowers predominantly. Um, but as I say that that would have come slightly later um, if these were all of early construction. And here, while we're here, we can see the concrete uh, firing benches. So this is why I say it would have, there, would have, there would have most likely been a pair um, of machine guns, medium or heavy machine guns here. A pair on the other side as well, but also in the middle with this um, front window missing. So there is a step that has been added here in all of in all of these pillboxes. So it may be that actually a wooden platform could have been trued across the front, um, which would then allow the uh, the fires to to use this front loophole. But as the position changed, in order and if you look at the, the logistics here, in order for the machine gun to fire right down the line of anti-tank obstacles. The fire has to be in this position. So by removing this step, it allows the fires of those machine guns to get into the position um, to provide that interlaid fire down the line. So if there was a permanent uh, concrete shelf there, that just wouldn't have been possible. Uh, and this number 16 is also one of our damaged pillboxes as well. So as I say, I'm not sure whether these were used for training um, purposes or whether this was post-war demolition practice, um, but there's not, not much else damaged other than, other than that single area. So that's inside number 16. We will keep going up the line. Number 17. Eighteen. Just as a point on my numbering system, this bears no relation to any official defence plan. I literally started counting at the western end, number one, and I'm counting all, all my way up uh, until I finish uh, at the other end. So, yeah totally arbitrary numbering system. One, we're currently at 18, 
and there's at least six left. I've <sighs> only been doing this eight and a half hours. Let's go. So we've made it so far to post number 19, another one of these twin gun machine gun posts. Some of the concrete has uh, most likely due to due to reasonably poor quality. You can see there's not much, there's lots of voids, there's not much cement. Um, yeah, in between those that, those beach pebbles. And if they haven't been washed, then that will just uh, uh, create more saltwater erosion. And we can just take a peek inside through the front loophole. So reasonably compact, as you can see, and we have the, the two firing benches, one either side. Looking up this fabulous row of anti-tank cubes. But alas, I need to keep pushing forward. I've got a car to get back to. So onwards. We'll give a passing wave to number 20. So what it looks like 21 sits at a crossroads. Uh, these cubes are actually from the gap that, that has opened up over here. Um, the tower in the background is unrelated to the wartime defences. It is a sentry post. It would be the eastern lookout for the firing range that we've just passed um, to make sure that nobody encroached into the danger area when the range was live. So yeah, here we have it. Post number 21 in great condition as most of these have been apart from the ones that have been blown up pillbox 22 so one noticeable thing about this pillbox is we don't have pebbles on the roof anymore so the pebbles on the roof have um, have stopped being added uh, not being aware of what end they started from whether that was a design change that um, that was added or was stopped with time um, but yeah there are no no pebbles bedded into the concrete of the roof of 22 uh, you can see also the terrain is is now changing um, so where we had where we had lots of lots of ground between us and the big the big gravel bank with um, the sea and the shore in front of us, this of course wouldn't wouldn't have been there uh, during the war. Otherwise, these these defences would have been rather pointless. But now we're starting to lose uh, we're starting to lose this this sort of no man's land scrub area, and the stones are really starting to impeach on the on the defences as you can see. So that really is the, the last pillbox on grass and the scrubland. All the rest will, uh, will, be, will be buried into the stones. And as we will start, we will start to see their demise um, as, they, as they, they start to enter the water and erosion kicks in. Uh, so yeah, let's keep, let's keep move, moving towards the end. And we'll now, we'll now start to see, uh, see some changes. Number 23, and this really is the beginning of the end. The pillboxes and the anti-tank cubes are now in the water and they're starting to erode and disintegrate quite badly. So looking back at the beach, it's not, it's not going to be long before the ones previously succumbed to this fate. Yeah, so let's let's get down and have a look at some of the some of the damage the Germans never managed, were never given the opportunity to do, um, but the tide has. And here's a difference again. I've just noticed. So, so here is one of 
the pillboxes with that. When I initially described the, the row of, of large beach pebbles or rocks around the edge, this is what I had seen. So some of the pillboxes have roofs entirely covered in cement and stones. Um, others like this just have the edging done um, or previously as we've seen some have none at all. So that must have been up to the discretion of the um, of the engineers or the civil engineers who were constructing it at the time, although essentially the workmen, the concreters um, at the time. So and just look at the erosion of some of these cubes. Incredible how smooth tide action, presumably they have essentially been pebble washed with every tide coming in. But it does does leave some very sharp rebar ends. A good example as to why these sites aren't aren't always the safest if you're not paying attention. Now down in the sandy part of the beach, tide is going out nearly at low tide for this evening. And yeah, we can see none of these were visible on my walk up this morning. As the tide is just coming in. But each one of these having been eroded and pummeled by the pebbles on a twice daily basis. And finally, number 24. 24 pillboxes over probably about 10 or 11 kilometers connected with anti-tank cubes protecting this Bay of Spey. We've got Lossiemouth to the west, we've got Kingstown just inland to the east. Tide has is, is recycling for us. The stones are being returned to the beach. The cement is being redissolved. And that is as far as we can go on this journey. It's been quite a day. I didn't, well, I did initially set out to hike to all pillboxes following the anti-tank line. And I really wanted to see that emergency coastal artillery battery. It's one of the it's one of the less less photographed, less visited ones. Really, because it's you know you have to walk six k to get there. Really, from any direction, there's no there's no shortcut. Uh, but I've achieved it. It's taken me. I keep looking at my watch. I, I started a hike on it earlier, and it's 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 basically it's nine hours from when I started started the the hike recording nine hours and 24 and a half kilometers and it's been stunning scenery I must say but I come back here yeah on a holiday but I come back here to rewalk that defensive line probably not if I'm honest there are two types of pillboxes there's a pretty standard coastal artillery uh, emergency coastal battery um, and once you've seen one, you've seen them all. And that is that is rare for me to say. Perhaps I'm just tired. Oh, do you see? I hope I caught that. The dolphins. Oh, I hope, yes. You've definitely caught that. I might need to zoom in. Again, forgive the graininess if I do. Oh, what an end to the day. Okay, would I come back? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe just to sit at this end of the beach and watch the dolphins. Oh, incredible. Keep hitting the like, keep hitting the subscribe button. And certainly comment down below if there's anything you'd like me to expand on. I have picked this up from reading books, watching documentaries. Um, I'm, no, I'm no expert. I'm just trying to interpret what I see. Um, interpret what I see in front of me and look at, look at different examples uh, from around the country and around the world. Um, so do all those things. If not, I will see you in the next video.